In horror movies, what's a jump or a jump scare? When something happens, we're telling the story, and suddenly what makes you jump is a flash, is someone passing behind, this happened in Sixth Sense to great ex, uh, example. Someone passes in your visual field and it startles you. It's usually accompanied with what they call a musical sting, which is suddenly the strings or the horns or something dissonant in the piano, and it, you're, you're unexpected. People yell out, this happened to me just last week. I was watching a movie with my kids up in Fort Collins. Spectacular, it makes you pay attention. Uh, and it's especially used in horrors and thrillers to keep you on the edge of your seat. Uh, sometimes the kind of comical effect, nonsensical things happening just to startle you. It makes you pay attention. In Luke's gospel today, we have two jump scenes, I think. We're halfway through this gospel. We're turning a little more conventional in the coming weeks as we go towards Holy Week crucifixion, resurrection. We know where this goes. Those stories will take care of themselves. We've been leading into the gospel and getting into teachings. Today, I like to think of two texts to startle you awake. The first that you just heard, a little bit gory, a little bit like a, raise your hand if you like horror movies. Anyone confess to liking horror movies in, in church? Good for you. Horror movies tend to be graphic and violent and startling. That's how they get your attention with or without a jump scene. Today, uh, the most graphic image in all of the New Testament with the exception of Revelation. Revelation is one horror scene after another. In terms of the Gospels, today's story that Jesus tells in Luke alone, the most graphically descriptive, scary, violent image we get in all the Gospels. Extraordinary. And then the text I'm going to read to you in a minute uh, more of a thriller. If you think of horror movies as graphically extraordinary, thrillers as emotionally suspenseful, make you think about it, make it edge your sheet because you're wondering what is going on psychologically. These two texts to me stand out together. The second one especially, uh, my favorite of all of Jesus' parables. Um, all right, so we just read, just got heard so ably uh, from Sue, this wonderful scene of Lazarus. Do you know, <laughs> you're forgiven. Uh, do you know the song? Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of... Do you have any idea what year it was when you learned that song? So high, you can't get over it. So low, you can't get... Our uh, high school, junior high. Peter, Paul, and Mary, I believe, had a version of this that made it a folk song that we were learned in, in Sunday school, so wide you can't get... This song was strange for me, in part because um, I didn't think we should be singing about bosoms. I was just, I, that just made me anxious as a kid. How could this be okay? So uh, The second thing was this. I realized this week I was a little confused. So high can't get over it so wide you can't get around it this sounds like a very fat person so low you can't get under it and the Abraham I was thinking of was frankly tall and skinny and wore a black stove pipe hat and so I was I was a confused child I don't know if we we're doing the Civil War at the same time because it's this text that the song is written about this tradition of going to the bosom of Abraham in security uh, Robert I forgot to ask you a minute ago uh, are there other examples in the Old Testament of where this is lifted up as kind of salvation to go to the bosom of Abraham? It means you're okay. God loves you. You're going to heaven, basically. Can you, can you think of anything? In the Old Testament, I can't think of anything right now. All right. So really we have just from this verse where in the horrific image of hell and burning, we have the alternative, which is, ah, Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. Here's the story. There's a rich man. He's not helping Lazarus, who's at his gate, covered in wounds. After they both die, Lazarus is revealed to be here in heaven at the bosom of Abraham. Wonderful. Oh, that Abraham. Our shared Abraham. The rich man, he's called Dives, D-I-V-E-S, or Dives, it's really a translation of the Greek word meaning rich person. Uh, so sometimes they give him a name. 
What's peculiar about this, here we go. Uh, this is the only parable of Jesus. I'm going to tell you why, how it's, you already know it's horrific. Uh, it's also the only parable where Jesus gives them names. And that's peculiar. A man went out to the field to, th to sow some seed, four kinds of seed, we get it. A man had two sons, to one, that, there's never any names given. There was a man who walked down and, and r fell amongst robbers. Once upon a time, there, there's no names. Suddenly, in this story alone, in Luke, and that's why I think they gave the rich man transition Dives, and Lazarus, peculiar because Lazarus in this story is at the bosom of Abraham, and he's asked to be resurrected and go and warn. And so the only other Lazarus we know, of course, is in John's Gospel, chapter 11, where Lazarus is raised from the dead. So, it, so there's books about this. What is Jesus thinking of? What is Luke confusing here? How is it that the only story that has names to these parables, teachings, happens to have Lazarus, and he's also dead and going to be raised? Interesting. Rock of my soul. Here's... Another version, we love, there's so much artwork on this because we love this. Three-tiered universe. Heaven, where uh, Abraham goes and he's got Lazarus at his bosom and then there's the dinner party in the middle. You can't really see, here's a close-up. Um, after the dinner party, there's salvation and then, of course, there's damnation. And we get a little inured to this from Revelation, but really, when you think in the Gospels, there's nothing else this dramatic, this horrific. Oh, Lord, I'm so thirsty. Could he just dip his finger in water and drip it? What a horrific scene. Misery. Burning dogs with him. He's being tormented. He's in the flames and this huge gulf. It's a scary, scary scene in our Gospels. You might have this scene. Um, I would think parallel to this, we have teachings in the Gospels about uh, being cast into outer darkness. And that's about as explicit as it gets, not this horrific details. We have uh, in Matthew 25, sheep and the goats. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth when they're thrown out. You know these horrific texts, they should stick with you. They really, when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're panting and breathing or maybe crying a bit and your wife's rubbing your back saying, it's okay, it's just a dream, it's just a dream. And you've suddenly had something in your head that just keeps you up. That's what these texts are supposed to do. You go about your day thinking, uh, well, I never see Jesus naked or hungry, really. And then in the middle of the night, you wake up and go, it's as much as you didn't do it to the least of these. That's what's wrong. Or you think about poor rich man uh, burning. Here, drinking from a cup. Here's Lazarus at Abraham's bosom looking out into damnation and they're being called to I'm so thirsty can you give me just a little bit to drink nothing needs adding here's what I would have expected from this story because this is a great theological image in the story there's a huge gulf you rich person you're in damnation calling out for mercy and the answer is uh, there's a gulf, but luckily our belief is no matter how messed up you are, how many horrible things you've done, how desperate your life is getting, the cross of Jesus is a bridge and you can be made whole again. If you can get in touch with how much God loves you and receives you, then in Christ you can be made whole, healed. Hope for salvation in heaven. There's a, there's a perfect image, but instead this. From this story, before we move on. Um, I like the nobility of the rich man who, when he recognizes he's done for, says, well, because the gulf is too great, we can't get there. What a hopeless, that's the most hopeless sentence. All right then, could at least you raise Lazarus? Have Lazarus go and warn my dad and my siblings. Make an example out of me. I, I, have, I have tenderness towards this rich man. Beautiful. And then... Uh, and then this, um, why? I, far be it from me to question our Lord and Savior about the stories he tells. This is a powerful, scary story. But I would like to pull Luke aside when I meet him and say, wow, you chose lots of stuff to omit. Maybe you could have let this one go because this haunts me at night. 
And how, Luke, how, oh, how could you deliver? Uh, you might want to, you should see this. Turn to your books because we're going to be there in a minute. I think this is the bleakest line in all of Scripture. It's certainly a line that doesn't belong in the New Testament. It's the most despairing and hopeless line of the book in front of you. And that's saying a lot. The punchline is this. You already heard it. Send them to warm my siblings. No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Oh, so good that you think of others even though they've just said there's no hope for you. And then this. Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. How did that line get past the editors of the New Testament? How does that not fly in the face of everything in the core of Christianity, spoil the punchline of all the Gospels and say, you know, we're going to read about a resurrection, but we've already had the foreshadowing of, it's not going to work. People won't be convinced. How, Luke, could we just, could, I think it's the worst line. Also, uh, you know me, liberal progressive, I'm fine with uh, Jews and Hindus and Muslims, and, uh, but what really annoys me, I have a thing about Mormons. It's a petty thing that I'm going to, there's no doubt going to be conversations in my future about this. The reason is, is because of supersessionism, all right? Mormons coming along saying, uh, your Christianity is fine, but it's incomplete. If you just read Pearls of Great Price, Doctrines and Covenants, readings of Joseph Smith, Mormonism completes your incomplete Christianity. It's called supersessionism. I find it an immense offense, more offensive than other parallel traditions. That I'm fine. Hey, you've got your path. Let's, let's talk. This is, of course, the complaint that Jews have about Christians. We come, well, Judaism is fine, except that we've got Jesus. And now we're the complete ones. Uh, what an insulting stance we've often had towards our forefathers, foremothers in the faith. How is this verse not on Jewish t-shirts? <laughs> How is this not their favorite verse to say, look, they've got Moses and the prophets. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither Will they be convinced if someone raises from the dead? How is that not the best judgment of Christianity from the Jewish standpoint? And Luke, really, couldn't we have just cut this before? Extraordinary. There's a horrific text and um, a thrilling text to me. I think about this judgment. I think about him burning in flames, about the thirst, about the futility, the sadness, all the best Thriller movies, by the way, horror movies, have a deep sadness at their heart. There's a deep sadness here, and uh, oh, we're lost. We're lost. Extraordinary. It's not a surprise to me that other gospel writers didn't include this story. All right, now, 